Hi, I'm Donna Rutherford and today I'm going to talk about using GEDmatch. Um, I'm a genetic genealogist in my spare time and I'm going to talk today about using GEDmatch mostly for ancestor projects. So what is GEDmatch? It's a public DNA database for autosomal DNA, so you won't find Y-DNA or mitochondrial DNA results at GEDmatch. GEDmatch will take uploads from all the DNA test companies, so um, 23andMe, Ancestry, MyHeritage, Family Tree DNA, and of course Living DNA. All those, uh, all those uh, data files can be uploaded into the GEDmatch database. When you upload your DNA file, you get a kit number, so everything we do on GEDmatch is related to our kit number. Anyone can run a kit number report, so as if they are you. So we do try and keep our kit numbers fairly private, but of course we are sharing them when we match with somebody. So just be aware it is a public DNA database, meaning anyone with your kit number can run reports as if they are you. It's also available for law enforcement matching. We can opt out of this, so use the little police icon. We can opt in and out of law enforcement matching, but do note that you cannot opt out of human remains matching. Everybody is uh, can be matched to any human remains that are uploaded by law enforcement, and that includes the controversial baby cases as well. So GEDmatch holds a lot of technical reports and calculators. So what are ancestor projects? Well, these were set up in 2019 for GEDmatch members with a common research focus. So a group of people who are researching around a common location, common family, and so on. The type of project is usually surnames or a type of location, but there's uh, GEDmatch projects for all sorts of things. Within the project, you can run a report to find out if you've got any matching segments or any DNA in common with other project members. And it's often supported by a Facebook group. So you've got somewhere to discuss the results and share with each other how you might be connected. You log into GEDmatch via their main page at gedmatch.com. And then it looks a little bit like uh, you can see on the top right hand screen here. So each DNA uh, upload has a kit number and this kit number is the alphanumeric number that I mentioned before. Now older kit numbers will start with a test company initial, so A for Ancestry, H for MyHeritage, M for 23andMe and uh, there's a few others as well. More recent kits though um, now have a random character at the start of the kit number and on the right hand side of a screen you'll usually see where that kit has come from, which test company. So the older kits have got migration but you can tell where they've come from based on the starting character of their kit number. Now all the kits you've uploaded are on the left hand side of your GEDmatch page when you log in. You can log into the classic or the new login. Now I typically now log into the new pages. Uh, the formatting's nice, everything's really easy to find. To find your ancestor project after you've logged in, on the right hand side of the screen is a list of all the reports that you can access. And you can scroll down and down near the bottom is Ancestor Projects. When you go to Ancestor Projects, you run a report and it's actually a segment analyzer report. So this doesn't show you a list of all the matches in their total shared centimorgan amount with you, but it's just a list of um, specific segments that you share with people. And matching segments are an unbroken run of DNA shared with you in your match. Now, some of us could share several segments and others might just share one segment. Where a matching segment is on a cro chromosome is not overly important for this type of research work. Uh, so it doesn't matter specifically which chromosome it is on. From the report, you don't know if the matching segment is your paternal side or your maternal side. So like always with an autosomal DNA test, the test itself can't tell you if you're looking at maternal DNA or paternal DNA. So you should not assume that the matching segment that you have with somebody else in the project actually comes from a relationship that is part of the project focus. Um, so you could be working with very small segments and it might be a, a segment that you actually share with someone on a completely different branch than what your specific proce um, project is looking at. You run the report using your kit number. So you shouldn't really share your report outside of the group. In fact, uh, GEDmatch forbids you to share reports um, anywhere other than in, in private with people that you're working with. 
And this is due to the private information because it includes your kit number and your email address and even segment data. And anyone who has your kit number can run a report as if they are you. So it actually means that they could run a report and look at all these different things as if they were actually you. And that's because it's a public DNA database. Now you can submit all your results to what they call multi-kit analysis. That means once you've found somebody with a common segment, then you can submit that kit or several kits within your project report off for multi-kit analysis. And it's marked as MKA on the report. And we'll have a look at that in a minute. Now GEDmatch analysis tools um, are fantastic. So there's a lot of other analysis tools outside of the actual project report. It's worth running a one-to-one a one -one report with anyone that you do share a close match with. So if you are sharing quite a few segments or it's a match that you're quite interested in, it's worth running a one-to-one -one report. In fact, this, the defaults used for different reports within GEDmatch are all quite different. So the one-to-one -one report is the report that we would use if we were trying to um, predict a relationship. So when you run your segment analyzer report in the project, this is the type of the report that you will get back. And you can see if we read across from the start of the columns, the first column is um, where you can submit this kit for multiple kit analysis. So if you were going to send them off to do more analysis on and some of the other tools some of the other reports and calculators, uh, you would tick that and you could send them all off uh, for the multiple kit analysis. The next column is the kit number. So this identifies who it is that you're uh, matching. And as I said, the earlier kits have uh, the name of the, or the first letter of a company name in front of the numbers. So you can see there, there's some kits with A on them. Those will be ancestry kits. And if you look to the far right on the source column, the very last column, you can see those particular kits and migrations, but you can tell they come from ancestry because they start with A. Now the top one has a random two characters RT, it doesn't mean anything, it's just random. And actually if you go to the right of that, you can see the source file of that was actually an ancestry DNA test. Now, as you go along the fields, there's the name that the person has called themselves at GEDmatch. And then the next column is really useful, it's whether they have a tree attached or not. So you will see the little tree there if they do have a tree available. It's a GEDcom that they may have uploaded. And again, if you've got your, um, if you've got your DNA kit in a project, it's worth uploading your tree to help your matches. The next columns are whereabouts on the chromosome that you actually match on this particular segment. And um, you can see here in this particular snip of the report, we've got some matching segments on chromosome 6, 3, the X chromosome, and also chromosome 1 and 2. And some of those are with the same people. So I share multiple segments with the people that have come up in this particular report. The next places are the start and stop place on the chromosome itself. And this is a specific part of the chromosome where this matching segment of DNA is. And it's not overly useful to know um, at, at this point of um, time where that actually is on the chromosome or even which chromosome it is. You're probably starting off just to have a look to see if you've got any matching segments with anybody in the project. As you go across, it will show you how much um, DNA you share on that particular segment. So with the top one here, I share 11.6 centimorgans. And as you go down, you can see the next one down, it's actually the same person. And, um, oh no, it might not be actually. The next one down, I share uh, start and stop positions uh, on chromosome three, and I share 21.3 centimorgans there. The next column is the SNPs. Now SNP stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. You don't really need to remember that name, but SNPs are actually the markers or the, the specific markers within your DNA that are tested. And when we do a DNA test, they test about 600,000 to 700,000 SNPs. And these SNPs or these markers, we need to make sure that when we're matching with people that we've got a good overlap of the um, tests that they've done with the tests that, um, that you've done. And that's because if people have tested different parts of the chromosome, but you've got one or two kind of matching areas, it's not really a very good match. It's a low confidence match because you're not really testing the same markers or a lot of the same markers. So the more SNPs in your comparison, the better. 
The next column is actually the overlap. So this is for the full kit. How much is there an overlap with where this person tested based on where you tested and your particular kit? So again, the higher, the better. And there are times you'll see quite low numbers in the overlap. And that will often happen with like a living DNA test because living DNA might test different parts or do test different parts of your chromosomes than say Ancestry does. So again, if there's a low, low, low overlap, it's a lower confidence that this is a really good segment of DNA to look at. And then the next column is the MRCA. Now it stands for most recent common ancestor. This is purely a, just a mathematical calculation. It's not even a very good one to use. Um, but to, if you want to understand what it means, basically it counts back from you to a parent. So uh, your parent is, is one generation, your grandparent is two generations, your great grandparent is three generations and so on. So you would count back to work out whether based on this very basic mathematical calculation where a, a common ancestor might be. So in this top one of 5.13, I would go one for parent, um, two for grandparent, three for great, four for great great, three times great grandparent. So I'm probably looking back round about the three time great grandparent mark. Now the one po the point something is is just meaningless because it's a mathematical calculation they just show you all the decimal points as well. It doesn't mean it's a half relationship. It doesn't mean you need to go a bit further. It's just a very very basic calculation. So actually I'm going to look at show you another way to work out um, how you might match someone, what a possible relationship is, rather than use this calculator at GEDmatch. Now the next column is the email address as entered by your um, by your match. So always very helpful because you can contact your match using that email address. The next two columns are haplogroups. Now you get haplogroups when you do a Y-DNA test or a mitochondrial DNA test. Uh, Y-DNA test is um, on chromosome 23, but it's for men only when they do a Y-DNA uh, test. Now these are self-reported. That means if there's a haplogroup in a field here, it's because the kit owner has gone and manually written it in just gone and typed in the field what their Y haplogroup is. It's not something that GEDmatch does. And that's the same for a mitochondrial DNA test. Now we can all take mitochondrial DNA tests because we all have mitochondrial DNA. It's absolutely nothing to do with chromosomes, so don't mix it up with xDNA. It's something uh, quite different. We all have mitochondrial DNA, but we only get it from our mother. So uh, when we pass on our, our mitochondrial DNA, for example, my son has my mitochondrial DNA, but if he has children, they will have the mitochondrial DNA of their mother, so he doesn't pass it on. And again, if it's in this field, if there's a, a character, a, a, um, some characters and numbers in this field, it means someone's manually just gone and typed in their mitochondrial haplogroup result from doing a mitochondrial DNA test. These could be very high level um, haplogroups or very low on the tree of mankind haplogroups, depending upon what test uh, your match has done. Um, then the last column is the source. So this is where I say, if it's an older kit, it's been migrated into this database and um, the, the starting character of the kit number will tell you whereabouts that kit came from originally. If it's an older, if it's a, sorry, if it's a newer kit, uh, then the source will tell you where it came from. So this top one is um, from an Ancestry DNA test. And that can be helpful because if you've both tested on Ancestry, you might want to go back there and see what your sharing DNA is there, where you could perhaps compare trees and find some more shared matches. So now we need to run one of these reports. And this is what it looks like when you go and run the report. Now there's only one parameter that I would suggest you change. You type your kit number in at the top where it says your match kit number. And the next one down says the lower segment centimorgan threshold. Now it actually has seven centimorgans in there as a default. Now I'm going to be probably somewhat controversial here, but I'm going to suggest you should really put in about 10 centimorgans there. That's because seven centimorgans is actually cut off where a segment it becomes more likely to be a false match rather than a genuine match. So we can match people just by coincidence because when we're dealing with very small amounts of DNA, it can just happen to look the same. Remember, we've got a paternal and maternal DNA all at the same place because we've got two of each chromosome. And it can be a little bit 
of each chromosome, each of your paternal and maternal chromosomes that just happen to be in the same pattern to make it look like a match to your to your um, to the person you're matching with. But it's not really shared DNA and it doesn't come from a common ancestor. When matches are smaller than um, seven centimorgans, it's much more likely that any match is going to be false rather than to be genuine. Now, certainly above seven centimorgans, there's still going to be false matches, um, and you just need to work out what they are based on using um, using some other ways of working like shared matches and doing genealogy, trying to understand um, if you, this is a real match or not. But certainly small matches become much harder to use as any evidence of um, a genetic relationship because they are very small. It's just like um, it's like comparing two very small things, like maybe looking at your little toenail and saying, does my little toenail look, look like yours? Look, it looks the same. Therefore, we must have a common ancestor. Well, of course, that's not the case. So um, we just need to be careful when we're working down with these small matches that we interpret them properly. And we don't we don't start to say these are absolute 100 percent confirmation of a genetic connection. So uh, false positives are matches that aren't from a recent common ancestor, and we call them, um, when, when we have DNA that is identical by descent, we call it IBD, identical by descent, and that means it really is um, DNA that has come down from a recent common ancestor. So if you actually start your lower threshold at 10 rather than 7, you're going to get rid of um, a lot of the false, uh, false matching. And it's much easier trying to interpret and use those higher centimorgan amounts. So small segments are actually a topic of much debate in the community. And um, it, whenever anyone starts talking about small centimorgan, small segments, somebody uh, jumps in with reasons why we should or, or shouldn't use them. But whilst a small segment may be evidence of a very distant shared ancestor, it's also not very good evidence because we could be sharing DNA with somebody on a branch 10 generations back, somewhere where we haven't even been able to get genealogical records. So just because we share DNA with somebody on a close genealogical connection, doesn't mean that the DNA has come by that route. The DNA could have come from somewhere else in your tree. And with science, what we want to do is always try and uh, rule out that this evidence couldn't have come from somewhere else. There's a new blog by Blaine Bettinger who put out a fantastic blog a few years ago, actually back in 2017, called A Small Segment Roundup. And there he talked about small segments being akin to poisoned M&Ms. So if someone gave you a bowl of M&Ms and said, uh, would you want some M&Ms? And said, oh, but there's some poison ones in there. So if you had those, you'll die, but you can't tell which ones are poison. Would you actually put your hand in, take a handful and eat them? No, you probably wouldn't because you could end up dying. You just don't know because you can't tell which are the poison M&Ms. And this is the same with small segments. They could actually be poison in your research because if they're small, they could be false or they could be very distant. And you may have a closer genealogical relationship that you haven't got that DNA from. So you need to be really careful that you're not polluting your research by attributing high confidence to these small matches. Now, Blaine's just put out just this month, he's in August, he's put out a new to uh, blog on this topic. And it's really worth going to have a look at that as well. And it just explains why, from a scientific point of view, we need to be very, very careful of using these um, small segments. So after you've found some kits of interest in your, in your reports from the pro, um, project, it might be interesting to see if you share the same genealogy. Again, just remember, just because the DNA you share DNA, it doesn't, and you find some genealogy in common, it doesn't mean the DNA came via that route, and especially if it's a small segment. Now, if you match someone as a parent child, I think it's pretty easy to tell you know that's where the DNA did come via that connection you found as parent child. It's a huge amount of DNA. You can't really share it with anyone other than a parent or a child. Uh, so it's pretty easy, very simple really, to rule out that that. 
DNA couldn't have come from somewhere else. Well, in fact, it could have with a parent child. If the parent or the child has had a bone marrow transplant, they could be carrying the DNA of their donor. So uh, you could match with someone as a parent child and then not actually come from that genealogical connection. It's just that they've got um, DNA from a donor. So, um, so, so there even are some tricks around parent-child relationships. But remember, when we get down to things like 7, 10, even 20, 25 centimorgans, we're dealing with segments that could be false and we're dealing with segments that could be very old. So we may find lots of genealogy in common if we come from a settler type population. We could have seven or eight different relationships with one of our match on all different branches of our trees. We can't tell where that which relationship that DNA has actually come from. So just be careful of thinking, oh, I found a genealogical connection, so therefore the DNA must come from there. One of the things we can do at GEDmatch, and one of the reports that we should always run when we've got a match that we're interested in, and that's the one-to-one -one report. All the different reports at GEDmatch have different types of cutoffs and different defaults that they use, but the most accurate for working out a potential relationship with your match is to run the one-to-one -one report, and we're going to have a look at it in a minute. So that's the report where we can more accurately work out what the potential relationship is to the person that we've found. So this is where you find the one-to-one -one autosomal comparison. When you um, go back to the home page of GEDmatch and scroll down all those tools on the right-hand side, you will find one called one-to-one -one autosomal DNA comparison. So this is the report that was really useful to run once you've got a um, or once you've got a match that you're interested in. When you run it, don't change any of the numbers. It is set to a seven centimorgan default, and that's the default that we use when we're trying to predict a rate relationship. If you drop that to say three centimorgans, then it may look like that you're actually a sibling to someone when you're only a fourth cousin because you've included and added up all these tiny segments. And that's not the way the relationship calculators work. They expect you to have used a default of about seven C2 organs being the lowest match. When you get the one-to-one -one report, um, there'll be a result that lists all the chromosomes you share on and a total shared CM at the bottom. And this is uh, the one I've run for somebody I match on the right. You can see the largest segment I share with them is actually quite big, 82 centimorgans. But this is someone quite close because I match 223.1 centimorgans with them. Now, the rough calculator has said it's probably about 2.5 distance back. So we know we count back from parents. So we go one to parent two to grandparent and then somewhere between a grandparent and a great grandparent is sort of the generation that I'd be looking at. But this again is this very basic calculation at GEDmatch and isn't the one that's really going to help us. There's, there's other ways and better ways uh, to go and work out what sort of relationship we might have with a 423 centimorgan match. So to do that, we would go to the Shared CM project at DNA Painter. This is the best calculator we've got really to predict um, relationships. And there we can go and we can type in 423.1 centimorgans and see what sort of relationship we could have with this match. And here it is on the right. I've typed in 423. And 80% of the time, someone who matches uh, this amount of centimorgans is going to be one of those relationships in the top grey box. Now, I know who this is. This is my dad's first cousin. Uh, so I am uh, his first cousin once removed. And you can see there on the second line down the top grey box that 80% of the time, um, it's one of these relationships for 423 centimorgans. And in fact, the relationship I expected to be is one first cousin once removed. And sure enough, there it is in the top box. So as well as talking about small segments, small matches are also an issue. So we do need to think very carefully about how much weight we place on using a small match as evidence of a relationship. Now, science tells us that about 90% of the time we should find a common ancestor uh, within about five to six generations for our matches greater than 30 centimorgans. 
So although match matches around 20 centimorgans can be recent, they can also be 10 generations back or more. So as we get lower and lower underneath the 30 centimorgans, we're going to find less and less uh, matches that we're going to be able to find a common ancestor within five to six generations. And good research is that we should always rule out that the DNA we share with somebody couldn't have come from a different branch uh, branch of the tree. If we're going to use it as evidence that it came from this particular genealogical connection we've found, we should go back and say, well, can we disprove that? Is there somewhere else in my tree that that DNA could have come from? And of course, this gets harder and harder with smaller and smaller matches where we could be going back well beyond the genealogical time frame. And of course, none of us have um, a tree that has 10 generations on every single branch. So we just have to bear in mind that we can't necessarily rule out that this small DNA match could have come from a common ancestor that we haven't yet found in our tree or might never find in our tree. So it's just a word of caution when we're using DNA. As so GEDmatch has a load of other useful reports and they're all listed on the right of the um, screen when you're back on the home page. So all the free reports are underneath um, the heading called free tools. Um, now some of these will be really useful and fun to play with and there's all sorts of diagnostics and, and different calculators and, and reports that you could be run that you can run be wary of some of them uh, the admixture calculators uh, some of them are really out of date or have very small reference populations and some of them are actually still on there but have been abandoned by their creators so if you're using the admixture which is like an ethnicity estimates using those be careful um, of putting too much emphasis on the results that you might get uh, some, some of those calculations um, for example you might you might want to see if you're Japanese and if you use one of these admixture calculators that's set up with only a Japanese reference panel of course you're going to look Japanese but of course you aren't Japanese so you just need to be careful how you're using those um, some some of the result, uh, some of the reports in here one of the most useful ones is the people who match one of two kits and it's really really useful um, because you're looking to see who our shares with you and your match and that can help point you to where you might be sharing the DNA. So for example, if I run the people who match both of one or two kits and put my mother in, I can see if people if um, people who match my mother, I know they're likely paternal matches or with a new match, someone I've, uh, I've found in the project, run that report with them, see my mother in there, then I can rule out that this being from my Scottish paternal side, and it's more likely somebody who matches on, um, well, will be someone who matches on my mother's side, if my mother's in there as well, uh, which goes back to uh, Yorkshire. So we just need to, uh, we need to use this report too, to, for more evidence of how we're sharing with the uh, match that we've found. There's also a load of additional GEDmatch reports, and these are by subscription. So uh, they have a subscription service called Tier 1, so it can be monthly, yearly, or just ad hoc. You might just uh, decide to take it for one month to have a look and see if any of these reports are useful for you. Um, GEDmatch have also recently lim limited the number of kits that you can actually upload on your account unless you are a Tier 1 member. So often useful to take a Tier 1 kit if you're getting to the limit and you want to upload some more kits. One of the ones I like on here is the Auto Kinship Report. This will do your auto cluster of all your GEDmatch um, uh, kits and, and uh, all your GEDmatch matches and it's really useful for working out all those clusters, those ge little genetic networks within your matches. So um, that's one of my favourites. There is of course a lot more to GEDmatch than we've covered. I just kind of give you a brief overview um, for, the, um, for those who are using Ancestor projects and wanting to know a little bit more about GEDmatch. Now the validated genetic genealogy research methods that we should be using, whether we're using GEDmatch or any of the other uh, DNA sites, is uh, the best way to work is cluster together your matches. And this means grouping your matches together, those that share DNA with each other. And this is called clustering or grouping your matches, creating like little genetic networks within your huge, um, huge list of matches. 
we should, when we're, when we're clustering together, we really should only go down to about 30 centimorgans, maybe even a little bit higher, 40 centimorgans. But when we start to go lower, if we're trying to cluster together people who share DNA, around the 20 centimorgan amounts, we could be have a cluster of people that all share DNA with each other in different ways, not necessarily because they all have a common ancestor. So the theory of creating these genetic networks is that each genetic network, each smaller group of matches, are likely to have a common ancestor. It's not always the case, but if they have a common ancestor, then that common ancestor is likely your common ancestor. So it makes it much easier to break down your, your DNA research into chunks. From there, we build out quick and dirty trees. So we have a little genetic um, network cluster that we're working on. Uh, we need to try and find the common ancestor of that cluster. And we do find that by doing genealogy. So we build a private and unsearchable tree. It's really important we do this very privately um, because this could include errors. We're just trying to do it really quick and dirty. So fast, accepting hints, copying things, all the things we wouldn't do on a normal, um, a normal family tree of our own. Uh, but this is just trying to work out how these matches all fit together. Sometimes we need to do some sleuthing to identify who a match is to bring them into this cluster and build their tree as well. Then we validate that the relationships we've found and how we align into the cluster is right. So uh, if you've found a second cousin, but you only share 10 centimorgans, then that's not a second cousin relationship. So you need to validate the relationships and the genealogy, making sure that the shared DNA maps and, and matches everybody within the group. Now, for unknown parent cases, if you're working those, the Watto tool at DNA Painter is uh, really, really useful. Um, I couldn't work without this tool. I use it for confirming trees and for unknown parentage cases. And it helps you work out once you've once you've built a, a cluster um, tree, a tree for that uh, quick and dirty tree for that genetic network, that cluster of people, then you could the Watto chart at uh, the Watto tool at DNA Painter lets you build that up. In fact, you can upload a GEDCOM, but it lets you build up the tree and then you can put in some hypothesis based on the shared centimorgans amount to see if you fit uh, where you should do within that tree, if all the centimorgans amounts uh, stack up. So it does all that really tricky um, maths work for you. So that's it. I hope it's just a really simple overview of GEDmatch. I hope it's given you some uh, food for thought, some ideas of going forward with an ancestor project, uh, what the data means when you're looking at it and how we might better work together uh, looking at the type of matches we've got and what we can do uh, once we've found some matches in common. So enjoy the ancestor projects, enjoy using GEDmatch. Um, if you've got any um, questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you so much for listening.